So without further ado yet, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, and an honor to be able to share our thoughts on the metaverse and NFTs and how we think it'll change the world. So I'm gonna put up a little sort of uh, slides, just go over it. Sometimes it's easier to sort of go through it and explain what we mean by all of that. So quickly before I sort of uh, talk about sort of the open metaverse and how NFTs matter, just very, very briefly, in case you don't know about Animoco Brands, um, you know, we are a company that have been, has been building really in the NFT space really since uh, late 2017, around about the time of the birth of CryptoKitties. And basically ever since then have been very actively involved in that space. I won't go into too much details. You can check our website, animocobrands.com. But one thing that you may have heard of, you know, we are the owners of the Sandbox. We have done over 100 investments in the space, probably the most uh, sort of well-known companies that we seeded back in 2018, 2019 in the early days are Dapper Labs, the creator of NBA Top Shot, OpenSea. If you're in the NFT space, you probably will have used their marketplace either to buy or sell, you know, Axie Infinity, which is the biggest NFT game uh, out there. And, you know, about a hundred other uh, so, sort of um, companies out there in that space. So we've been very focused in building it. And for us, it is really a mission, which I'll explain shortly. So let's quickly talk about sort of what is the metaverse first, because a lot of people have many debates about what that mat can and cannot mean. And what indeed is it? So if you just take the definition of Wikipedia, it defines it as a collective virtual shared space, which is basically the convergence of all things virtual, including the internet as a whole. And that may sound like a little bit of a sort of futuristic vision about how we might all interact. But maybe the first thing I would like to sort of all of us to consider is that perhaps we are already in a kind of metaverse already. When eight in 10 of the sort of US population and perhaps more in some other places are effectively online daily. And in fact, a third are online all the time. And when you start measuring the amount of time that you're spending on things like Instagram or Facebook or playing games or anything else that you do to interact, you may not necessarily be sort of in a virtual reality sense, like Ready Player One with a pair of goggles, but you're already engaged in a virtual world. And actually perhaps your self-worth and your identity when you consider the power of social media is perhaps already guided in that manner. How many likes do you have on Instagram? You know, how many people react to your Facebook posts? Do you look forward to that? What kind of sentiments and emotions do you have when you get, you know, a thousand likes? What do you feel like when you get no likes, right? These are actual real sentiments and feelings that you have. So perhaps the transplantation of our feelings towards the metaverse and everything virtual is perhaps more real than perhaps some of us care to admit. The other mega trend that's happening, of course, as well, is that over the course over the last 20, 30 years, now more than 60% of the world's connected internet are active gamers. And I don't mean casual gamers, the kind of people who basically play on average between 10 to 16, sometimes 20 hours a week. And on the extreme side, in fact, 40 hours a week, which seems basically as much as a full-time job. And the other thing to think about is that the gaming industry itself is 150 to $160 billion industry so far, of which $100 billion is already traded in these virtual goods. By virtual goods, we mean like skins in Fortnite or sort of Robux and Roblox and these type of assets. These are not necessarily assets that are real in a traditional sense, they are virtual goods, but the players that play those games have a relationship with these assets as if they are real. Right? Meaning that when I'm buying a skin on Fortnite, I assume that I own it. I don't think I'm renting it, even if the effect is the same. And of course, in the world of fashion, you know, you see this, whether it's in Fortnite or in other type of games or in Roblox, basically the brands, fashion, celebrities, everyone coming to ready, already basically offering these kind of virtual goods to users that are playing in these big uh, sort of quasi metaverses, as we call them, like a Fortnite, and basically experience that. And that's already happening right now right at this minute, um, you know, a very contributing part to that $100 billion industry. And so I would argue that perhaps we are already in a quasi kind of metaverse. But the question before we go into the details is, what kind of metaverse is it in fact? And who owns this metaverse? And so I think this is the part which perhaps is the most misunderstood that we think in this space overall. And it comes down to the very first thinking about what is the most valuable thing on earth today? Is it, you know, Sort of, uh, is it sort of energy? Is it oil? What is it that's really valuable? And I think most of us, and certainly we would submit that the world's most valuable resource is in fact data. And the data that we create or that happens around us, geospatial data, information that we provide, that basically is the most valuable resource. And they power the biggest companies in the world today. The thing about data, 
which is so often misunderstood is that when we our own generate our own blocks of data because we have some kind of information we don't think of them as particularly valuable because we don't know what to do with it but the thing about data is it actually has a very strong sense of gravity what i mean by that is that if data actually combines and connects with each other and forms new forms of information that data becomes heavier it becomes more influential it has more context and therefore becomes more powerful and we see this already today when you sit around the dinner table or when you hang with friends you're sharing information in fact what are you sharing you're sharing data you're sharing information about something you've experienced with someone else and he mixes that with his experience and he creates a new form of data that might be more informed and it creates gravity and those kind of gravity is basically what happens in the digital platform every day and that basically becomes heavier and more influential and in the same way that you want to hire an, an expert that has basically got 30 years of experience in fact what are you hiring with that 30 year experienced person you're express, essentially experience sort of buying his data gravity his knowledge that he has con connected through the interactions of hundreds or thousands of people or other things that he's lived through basically as a form of gravity that's why that person is valuable that's why you might pay him a lot of money because he has gravity himself that is effectively the virtual sense data gravity but the most valuable part of valuable part of that data gravity actually comes from something specific to all of us which is our time how we choose our time is how we deliver gravity imagine facebook without any users is facebook valuable not at all it is in fact only valuable because we surrender a lot of our data to facebook and give them a lot of information so in fact the parallel around data and the value of data and why we think it is so powerful is in fact data is a derivative of time that we spend on this earth and that is in fact the most scarcest resource for each and every one of us because at the end of the day we have a finite amount of time in the world each and every one of us means that we choose to spend that time do we choose to spend it something that's valuable do we choose to spend it to make money do we choose to build a business do we choose to spend a family those are all derivatives of our time and that time is data the problem is that who owns this data this most valuable of resources that comes from our precious time from our precious moments which will never come back the problem is it belongs to the platform how many here actually consider that the time you spend on Facebook every second or every minute that in fact you're enriching the platform which is Facebook or which is Amazon or which is Tencent whatever you want to call them well, these blocks of data may not be very valuable but they're pieces of information and as I described earlier data has gravity because they connect to knowledge and they create a network effect and that network effect is all powerful but in the same way that we have a network effect where maybe you know 10 or 20 or 30 people connect and talk to each other Facebook does this on a billion people every single day. The network effect is so powerful that, in fact, they know more about us. They can have influence over you know, things that we may not even imagine that we know about. They can manipulate our thought, as we have seen with things like fake news or other things like this, because they know more about our tendencies, more about our feelings than perhaps many of us do ourselves. So they become very, very powerful. And in fact, the most absurd thing about all this is that what do they do with this data? They sell it back to us. They sell it back to us in forms of advertising. In fact, if you build a page on Facebook and you want to advertise or promote to your end users, you have to pay Facebook to retarget. Essentially, they own all the data, even though it may have originated from you. So today we live in what we describe as in a form of digital colonialism. It is feudalism in the same way that it was five, 600 years ago, You know, where basically we are constantly giving up our most valuable resource to the platform. And the result, is a mass enriching of these platforms. If I had told any one of you, perhaps even five years ago, that the tech companies would be worth trillions of dollars in the context of that, you know, oil companies were actually worth, you know, 200, 300 million dollars or Walmart in that context, perhaps lots of you would have said, that seems preposterous that a technology company will be worth trillions of dollars, in fact, have larger GDPs than perhaps many countries put together. But the reality is that because they own the data, that most precious of resources. They have basically managed all this. They're not software companies. Yes, they create software, but the software is derived from the data that they have from us, from the knowledge that we have given to them. And the world today is that essentially of a digital data feudalism. And the walled gardens that you see, whether it is Apple or whether it is Google or whether it is Facebook or Tencent or whatever you want to call, essentially are these little kingdoms that are essentially protecting their data and what was once an open ecosystem has become closed 
because it's not shareable across each other because they're jealously guarding that data. And the other thing is this, they also control that life of ours because essentially we exist on their terms of service. What happens to your digital life if they deplatform you? What happens if you lose access to WhatsApp, to Instagram, to Facebook? Do you as a human being have the same economic potential? Do you have the same social potential? Can you meet friends the same way? And very likely, you actually are relegated to perhaps even a second or third class citizen because you do not have access to the services that a Facebook or a Google or an Apple can provide you. And that in itself means that actually they have the tools to really control our virtual lives because they control the data set. And the mass effect on this one has been obviously that there's a sort of global, uh, global drop and overall trust levels because we don't understand what's true and real anymore because actually governments used to be the ones that would sort of be a form of authority, but that's basically been all usurped. And, and the biggest issue, of course, is a rising inequality. Now, there's many other reasons behind this, but what we also think is, is that if data ownership, essentially that resource that we produce isn't actually owned by us, and it's continually owned by the platforms, we will see rising wealth inequality. The only way that we can participate in this growth is by buying shares in Facebook, right? or perhaps working there. But if you're not, you're out of luck. Everything else is left behind because it doesn't have the data. And so how do we deal with this? And what is the reaction to that? That is basically perhaps the biggest problem we see in the world today. And it, it affects everything in the creative space. If you just take that a little step further, whether it's people here creating digital fashion or whether it is, for instance, in the world of music, same thing. The data that is produced in the case of a form of music belongs to who? Even though you created the music, it's actually inside Spotify. Spotify is the one that controls the data. Spotify is the one that knows about the customer and is able to determine who is famous and who is not. Right? That's basically the world we live in today. So this is why blockchain has come around and the movement around Web3. A lot of people look at blockchain and think of Bitcoin, obviously, as, as sort of, you know, that, that, that sort of parallel around it. And I'll explain a little bit about the story around that shortly, just to understand a little bit about the culture. But really, if you go deeper, what is Web3? What is blockchain? It is not actually specifically about cryptocurrency in itself. That was one of the use cases. It is about owning your data. How do you own that data? Because the data structure is essentially a distributed and uh, this is a distributed ledger, completely decentralized, meaning it's a data structure that is not owned by anyone, but it's users who use it through a global network of systems that you know, I don't have to describe in too, too much detail, uh, we now have a redundant uh, database structure through millions and millions of nodes around the world that is owned only by the people who utilize it or who essentially sort of provide their own infrastructure to support it. It means that whatever you put on that data structure is immutable because it needs a consensus of all these other users, um, all these other nodes around the world. It also means that if you want to alter a piece of data or you want to modify it or even say remove it, you can't do that unless you have the consensus of the network. And that consensus isn't one company like a Facebook or one company like an EA or an Activision. It is in fact the entire network where you need at least 51%. You could say in many ways, blockchain is perhaps the truest form of democracy. You know, whether you agree with that system or not, you need the consensus of the network before anything can be changed or altered. And so let me tell you a little bit about the story of Bitcoin, because it's obviously the most famous example of blockchain and perhaps sometimes misunderstood as sort of, you know, as Janice said, the dark web and cryptocurrency. But why was blockchain born with, with Bitcoin first as its first use case? It came basically right at the uh, sort of, uh, sort of uh, second uh, bailout of banks during that time when uh, sort of, you know, the Lehman crisis back in 2008. And the birth of that in 2009, you know, specifically the Genesis block had this particular wording, you know, January 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout. Essentially, the very first Bitcoin that essentially was, was born, the Genesis, the Genesis block, was a protest. And it was a protest on the fact that banks are constantly printing money. They're supposed to have the sanctity of value, and they do not. And we need a new kind of currency that is not controlled by a single entity that can abuse it from their perspective. And this pseudonym or pseudonyms of people Satoshi Nakamoto basically created through this blockchain technology, essentially Bitcoin, right? Which basically was a currency that has a finite supply over time and that is mined over a period of time. And essentially you have certainty that the value, you know, as a store of value can be preserved because it's only a certain amount of, you know, uh, sort of a Bitcoin that can ever be made being 21 million. 
we can agree or disagree about sort of, you know, whether this is a good system or not. But the point is that certainty of 21 million Bitcoins, that certainty of what's in supply is immutable. Meaning that if I send you a Bitcoin and someone else receives a Bitcoin, I don't need a bank. I don't need a middleman to tell me whether that belongs to, 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 uh, to, to me uh, or is, is true because the blockchain verifies it instantly through the distributed ledger. When you receive money from a bank, you see a statement. The statement says you might have $10,000. That's great. But do you actually know if the bank has $10,000 in there? You don't. You trust because the bank is maybe licensed and so on that in fact it has $10,000. But what it does in the back is maybe a derivative of that $10,000 and it might be investing it or doing other things that you have no idea. You just trust that it's there and that it can move around. And in fact, many liquidity crunches, particularly in less stable banks, have come under because of the abuse of that trust. This is the first use case, and perhaps most famous use case, how blockchain was used. And the way that blockchain works in very simple terms is just every time a transaction is made, it creates a new block that is then propagated to every single node around the world, which means that in the case of a Bitcoin, every time when there's a transaction that is made, every single Bitcoin in the world has a uh, sort of a confirmation of that same transaction, meaning that millions of them have the same information and they chain to each other like a block, right? That's why it's called blockchain because the data essentially chains along forever. And whatever happens in that block is immutable and cannot be changed unless you have agreement from sort of uh, the consensus of that network, which is also the reason why tokens like Bitcoin get bigger and bigger and bigger over time because they just store more and more and more data over time. But that's basically how it works and it creates an immutable framework. The other thing that blockchain also now comes with something like Ethereum is that now it had the ability to actually take this decentralized infrastructure and not just store value, but actually become programmable. It means that you can basically take something like a, like, like a token in the case of Ethereum, and you can program it to do certain condition. The way to think of it is like, imagine you getting a US dollar or a, a currency, but that currency is already embedded with it with conditions. Like, you know, you may only buy candy with it or something like that, right? That's basically what you're now able to do as well. So what Ethereum ended up becoming this programmable layer that is essentially distributed and made safe and immutable through blockchain. So we went societally essentially from a system in the past where we would only trust each other as individuals to eventually with Web 1, Web 2 to trust the network. And now with blockchain to have an immutable community trust. Because the problem in the past was that when I sort of, you know, when I'm on the web with the problems we have with fake news or Facebook or whatever it is that we can't trust, I no longer trust what's happening in the world right now because I don't know if I can trust my friends or I can trust what people have said because that source of data is no longer certain. I don't know who made it. Is it CNN? Is it BBC? Is it my friend? I can't tell anymore, right? And now with blockchain, you know that source. That is immutable. What was said, whether it's a lie or the truth, is essentially there and creates a fault-tolerant community-based network. And that is basically what people describe essentially as Web3 and the movement around Web3 where everything is decentralized as a structure and everything is managed essentially on the edge. And the main parallel to think about this is with the revolution that's happening right now in the decentralized movement is that we're moving away from these sort of you know, walled gardens of sort of closed ecosystems like Facebook or Instagram or what you see in Google or in Apple into one that is completely interoperable and open with Web3 open protocols. And that's already happening right now with a big sea shift change. But I won't go into the details too much about each and every company, but to sort of pinpoint one particular case where decentralization has really moved on quickly, and that is DeFi. And the total value locked probably today is more closer to about $100 billion. What that means is that because of decentralized infrastructure, you now have what we describe as the bank of DeFi, DeFi standing for decentralized finance. It means that we now have an infrastructure in the world that is entirely protocol based, where you can interact like a bank with them, whether it's for lending, whether it's for liquidity, whether it's for other kinds of banking services, but on a protocol level where you no longer have to work through a middleman who you have to trust, but in fact, you interact with the sources of value and money directly, basically through the algorithm. And is able to do that through blockchain because blockchain essentially certifies the truth of that and the network to keep it immutable and safe. And that basically provided this incredible financial infrastructure that now powers on many of the DeFi applications that are out there. And with that, you know, we come into sort of the use cases of the metaverse 
because the metaverse itself was essentially a place of entertainment. But once you give it a financial infrastructure that is real and valuable because of cryptocurrency and because of the liquidity that comes around, you now give it purpose. And the metaverse has become one level more real because now there's value infused in this. Yeah? Now, how do you make sure that these things are in fact valuable or in fact real? Enter the non-fungible token. Now, you probably have much heard about NFTs. Lots of money is being made on NFTs, right? You know, you know, uh, the, the, the joke in the system is they're super expensive JPEGs. And of course, who wouldn't want a super expensive JPEG? But the concept of the NFT uses exactly the same technology as blockchain that powers Bitcoin in its principle, but essentially does it in a way where each and every token isn't fungible as in the same, it is in fact non-fungible, meaning that it has an element of scarcity tied to it. But the way to think about the scarcity is that it's simply a unique ID that can record a unique history and its unique moments. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a manufactured scarcity, which you sometimes see with many artists. You know, for instance, there's only one of one, one item or five items or 10 items, and that may or may not be interesting depending on what you do. But what is more interesting from our perspective is the relationships we now can have because of the non-fungible nature of digital assets for the first time. When you think of the physical world and the way we interact, for instance, like a wedding ring, the wedding ring in and of itself is probably not particularly valuable because of the silver, but what makes it precious, what makes it sort of absolutely sort of uh, invaluable in that sense um, is the fact that that ring came from, you know, was worn by your partner and, you know, on your wedding day and maybe three generations of your family has it and so on. That ring has no value perhaps to some stranger out there, but it has absolute value for your family. And so that non-fungible nature gives it that particular quality. And when we think about that in all of our physical world, the way that we have relationships with our physical objects, in fact, those physical objects are non-fungible in our relationships too. You know, photos, memories, first drawings of our children, you know, running shoes in which we want a marathon, right? These are all special things to us, but they only mean something to us. Now, when you transfer that in a digital context, you can do the same thing. You know, whether it's digital fashion, digital shoes, digital swords, digital cars, all of that can, can, can start to evolve that way. The other thing that's interesting, of course, is, you know, with NFTs, why are they so valuable? And what's so interesting? Because these are the relationships that we have with all of our objects, but they're digital. They may not appear to be real. But in this case, they're very real because in fact, the value that is embedded with them is in fact very, very valuable for, as I said earlier, the data that is created by us, right? Meaning the creativity or the culture that is embedded with it. And in fact, the nature of this um, here is if you take a look at just the last 30 days of NFT sales and trading volume, it is now close to $6 billion in the last 30 days and rising. So certainly when we, if we thought that NFTs were, you know, I think the quarter before had two and a half billion dollars of volume, you know, we thought that maybe that was a big number and maybe it was cooling down if you were to believe some of the headlines, completely the opposite is true. This thing is growing and growing and growing uh, even faster. And I think one way to think of non-fungible tokens is that, you know, again, these are cultural moments that people engage with, you know, and it started off with art, and with collectibles, and is now going into gaming. And of course, it's entering everything else in the world, meaning that we think of non-fungible tokens as that absolute parallel to everything we do in the digital world in the form of our data ownership or our contribution to, to digital lives. Let me explain that a little bit more deeply as to what we mean by that. An NFT to us, a true NFT, is an open digital asset. It does represent your data, right? But it means that that data sits in an open network and has a permissionless uh, experience, meaning that people can do anything to it and add their own data gravity, to it, their data gravity to it. It means that if I own an NFT and people give it more experiences and layer more benefits on top of it, it makes the NFT more valuable because it has more gravity, just like the example I gave with data gravity. Because in fact, what is an NFT outside of being a beautiful JPEG? It is blocks of data. And what it represents is a meta structure around all of that data. And I'll explain that maybe in this illustration in the form of you know, the sale of a car, but you can replace that with any object in the world. The digital world today exists in fact, just to sell cars. But when you think of a real economic structure, right? Uh, in terms of the sale of an object, the ecosystem in the case of a car around the ownership of cars is far, far greater than the sale of the car itself. Meaning that you know, Tesla or Volkswagen or Mercedes, sort of their value proposition and the sort of their industry and economies 
are actually multiple times smaller than the business of ownership of cars, meaning when you consider the construction of roads, the fuel economy, the people who accessorize the cars, who do paint jobs on the cars, you know, the mechanics, the drivers, you know, and everything else around, you know, people who make baby seats, whatever it is, these services and businesses around supporting sort of, you know, basically the car industry on a permissionless basis, meaning that those industries around it don't need to go for Tesla for permission to make baby seats for Tesla. It was just a service they added. And you can have competitive companies around the world who might offer this, or people who want to have, you know, leopard skins on their cars, for instance, right? Someone offers that service, great for them, they can customize it. They don't need permission from Tesla or from Volkswagen, right? That actual infrastructure is far greater and not outside of providing employment. The inverse of that, of course, is that it makes the cars themselves more valuable, meaning that the decision for you to actually buy a car will depend on the external infrastructure. Is there enough charging stations? Can there be enough mechanics? Does it take six months to get parts or can I get parts quickly, right? What do my friends say about the car? The external factors of value in the world of the asset ownership comes from these external factors that have nothing to do in sort of, in sort of a, a relationship with the car companies themselves. They may want to promote it, they may want to indulge in it, but they actually don't own them or can't tell them what to do. Meaning you create a peer-to-peer -peer business relationship and actually the power of that is another form of gravity. If there are no charging stations in Hong Kong, nobody will buy a Tesla, as simple as that, right? Um, and you know, an extreme example that may be, that is an example of data gravity as experiences and things layer on top. And that is what's happening in the world of NFTs and why NFTs are valuable. Because it's not just because you make one graphic or one image and you sell it. It's the entire gravity effect that comes around it. Meaning that can this object be used in five different places? How is it designed so it could be used in one game or another game? Is it something that other people can utilize? Do other people on a permissionless basis provided services? Like for instance, you can take an NFT and you can get a mortgage on it or you can lend against it for instance today because there is actual ownership around that, right? And those peer-to-peer -peer ownership economics is actually what makes the space so powerful and why the NFT is valuable. If you look at a board ape or if you look at a crypto punk, you know, that value comes from its community and what the community does to it, not necessarily what Yuga Labs or what Larva Labs in and of itself did to the asset. That's the starting point. Now, the way we like to think of non-fungible tokens is as a store of culture, because it embodies everything that we think of in terms of art, history, culture, moments, emotions, and feelings is essentially what NFTs represent to us and what it can represent, whether you're an artist, a fashion designer, or what, what not, to the equivalent of you know, if Bitcoin is a store of value. And the other thing I would like us to sort of contemplate as well is, in fact, this may seem all virtual. And why is it worth millions of dollars you know, um, and, 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 and all that? Well, if you think about when you buy an Hermes bag or when you're buying you know, to make a decision to choose a Nike shoe over a Puma shoe over an ASIC shoe, for instance. In fact, what are you buying between those shoes or with that bag? How much of that value comes from the material it's made of versus actually everything that comes entirely from the creativity and the mind of the person or the persons who made that product? I guarantee you, you know this probably better than me, that probably 99% of the value of that Hermes bag is entirely virtual and comes from an entire cultural virtual sense whether it's a powerful narrative, whether it's a beautiful story, whether it's a famous person, it is culture you're buying. And you're buying that and giving it a premium on that 99%. The actual material might be not even 1% in value and you don't care because what you're buying is that. And that is true for almost every object that we buy. When we choose to buy a shoe, we don't choose to buy a shoe necessarily because you know, of, of the fact that it gives us superpowers because buying a Nike or a Puma shoe probably won't make you run any faster. The utility has a certain limit, but you choose to buy it because maybe LeBron James uses it, or maybe because my friends use it. Again, objects like this have gravity, but that is something that we may intrinsically feel and can't quantify it. But with non-fungible tokens, that now becomes a quantifiable state because it's a data structure. So the thing to think about when you think about non-fungible tokens is that NFTs become the center of that experience. In other words, when you think of it in the context of digital fashion, you don't think of it in terms of, let me make a beautiful image only, but how can this piece of fashion be used in 10 different games? What meta structure do I need to think about so that it can be used? Because the more games or the more metaverses or the more places start giving utility or using it, the more valuable that collection becomes.
So it's the, it's the ups, it's the sort of flipped upside down because we're now not talking about the open metaverse. In a closed space, like a game or Facebook, digital assets or really virtual goods existed to support the existence of that experience. Like when you play a game, people made a game, I made, made, let's say for instance, a virtual gun to make the game more fun. But in this case, you make the gun and essentially the games or the experiences around it are actually containers of value for, for the gun that you can experience it, it, uh, experience it uh, better. And you see many of these examples already in the form of virtual land, like with Sandbox or Loot. If you haven't looked at that, Loot is fascinating because really it's just a bunch of generative text. But the generative text is reminiscent for the culture of Dungeons and Dragons. And because of that collection of these generative texts, of which there's only you know, several thousand of them, now have become very valuable because people are building experiences on top of these generative texts, of which there's a limited supply, as an example. Basically, it's just meta, meta structure or the board apes, for example. And you know, I won't cover too much about digital fashion in and of itself because you know, we have a panel afterwards that is expert to talk, talk about it. But you know, similar in that experience, whether you have you know, virtual sneakers, digital shoes, whatever, again, the utility isn't you know, just simply, does it look good and can it be representative? It's what is its utility? How can it be used in other experiences um, and so forth? So maybe just to close out, on a sort of, uh, I was asked to give a couple of examples of sort of virtual land. And you know, for instance, the Sandbox, which is one of our projects, Sandbox probably has become the, the premier place in which you can basically sort of develop virtual land. Uh, and sometimes often people ask, so why would I actually want to sort of buy a piece of virtual land? Because after all, I could just replicate that land anywhere. It's virtual, right? There should be no limit. And it's the same idea about, you know, why would you want to choose to live in the peak in Hong Kong or in, in sort of, you know, Tribeca in New York? You know, you could take that same building from the center of the most awesome place in Manhattan, and you could move it to the middle of Africa and it would simply have no value, right? And the reason why it doesn't have that much value is because what you're buying when you're buying a place in downtown Manhattan isn't in fact the building itself. You, you're basically buying the community, the population of people who live in New York, the cool people that hang out around that area. It's also the reason why some districts are more valuable than others because of who's living there and who is there. So the community, the network effect of that community is what you're buying in real estate. And that is exactly the same for virtual real estate. When I'm buying a piece of land in virtual real estate, you know, it, to us, it's kind of like, you know, Sandbox is like the fifth avenue of, uh, of, 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 of the metaverse. You want to buy something there or own something there to be able to market to the audiences in the world of NFTs, but also to demonstrate to a presence that you're serious in the world of non-fungible tokens as that example. Now, what's interesting about, about the Sandbox itself, as virtual as it may appear, you know, it's grown quite a bit. Um, you know, millions of dollars of sales. Land is growing incredibly. Just in the last uh, uh, last month, close to ten million dollars of uh, of NFT sales uh, have taken place. And the Sand token, which is the currency, is worth almost two billion dollars, depending on which day you look at. So it's as an economy, it's growing. But it's not alone. There's many other companies that are out there building in this virtual land ecosystem. And I'll quickly close on another thing when we talk about utility, because when you think about sort of you know, digital fashion, these are used in these metaverses and these games. I want to point you to one of our portfolios, which is a company called Axie Infinity, which today is probably the biggest NFT game that is out there today, basically generating something like $2 billion of sales a month. Uh, how does it do that? And what did it do? In a nutshell, basically, it, it is think of it as a sort of Pokemon sort of uh, meets Neopets type of game experience, except that they created a, a sort of a formula around the introduction of capital, which is the ownership of these um, assets, meaning axes and land, and they, are, they rent them out to people in places like the Philippines or Venezuela and so on, and have created employment through essentially the combination of capital and labor, and have literally lifted you know, hundreds of thousands of Filipinos out of poverty who couldn't work because of COVID, and now have found virtual employment in the metaverse in the form of playing a game like Axie or maybe even Rev or so on, uh, and basically earning on average between 500 to 1,000 US dollars a month, which is you know, basically a massive increase in their income. And what's interesting there is because how is that space fueled is that as they're creating this new wealth in the metaverse, they're spending that money in the rest of the other type of worlds, buying NFTs and fueling that as well. And that is just one example of, of many that is sort of developing in the space. And it's not just life-changing for people in the Philippines. It is also life-changing for people who are actually working uh, sort of, you know, like in, in developed countries, whether it's the US or Australia, for instance, you know, who are making up to 20, 30,000 US dollars a month 
playing these type of metaverse games at a very elite level, depending who you're, who you're talking to. So maybe just quickly, uh, I want to sort of share this as a little example, if you can see that. This, is a, this was something that was shared around some users in Twitter. And this is an example of the metaverse user that is existing today. It's not a VR goggle. It's not super, super uh, sort, of, uh, sort of sophisticated, but he's playing, in fact, three or four different games at the same time, right? And generating yield. Maybe he's generating on average through this experience, possibly 50 to $100 an hour. And that's how he's spending his time, creating value into that ecosystem by giving his time. Essentially that parallel that I mentioned earlier about what's valuable is our data, is our time. But now he's getting a fair return for having contributed to that ecosystem. And so the metaverse worker of the future is perhaps not exactly the way that we think of it. So in closing, uh, before we go into Q&A, I wanna point this part out, which is I spoke much about the metaverse, non-fungible tokens, its meaning. It all requires it to be open. And in fact, for creator community, the openness is absolutely critical because you do not want to be beholden to the large platform that gives you permission what to do with the assets. You want to know that the assets you create actually are yours and has long-term value. In the same way in the NFT world that when you create a digital asset and you sell it on and on, you can actually get a commission every time it sells on, right, for eternity. Because now that data structure and that social experience is tied to you. You own it. It's your data. It's your rules, right? But when you give it to someone like a Facebook or you go in a closed ecosystem, actually what happens there is they sort of may give you the pretense of something that seems attractive, but actually you're really just creating a walled garden and you're building in a jail, which may not feel like one until it's too late, which is what happened to most companies, if not all of them, who ultimately built on Facebook and suddenly find that they can't leave or be independent because it depended on them. And so when companies like Facebook or when Mark Zuckerberg says he wants to transform Facebook into a metaverse company, he knows what's coming. He understands the space. Those guys are smart. They know exactly what the open metaverse is about. But their metaverse is not one that wants to be open. Their metaverse is one that wants to control it. They are the kings today. They don't want to give it up. Very few kings, if any, willingly give up their kingdom. So I guess in closing, I just want to say that this is one of the most exciting spaces for the creator economy, the ownership of your data and the data rights that you can actually fairly monetize. But in order to get that fair right in the long term, it must stay open and you have to build open. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yat, for what I can really only describe as a metaverse masterclass. I have been absolutely astounded at the quantity of ground that we've covered over the past 45 minutes, as well as you know, some of the terminology you've been using, like digital colonialism, absolutely phenomenal. So thank you so much on behalf of me and every single other person in attendance for that. Um, I'm gonna very, very briefly uh, abuse the power that I have to ask you a couple of questions of my own before moving into kind of the general Q&A. Of course. Um, so what you mentioned just now, this idea of kings giving up their kingdoms, you know, in terms of virtual fashion, I see is so incredibly pertinent. I see it as the equivalent of me buying a dress that I can only wear in one area of London to maybe even one specific house party, which obviously might be a beautiful item, but it colossally diminishes the value for me. And, you know, as you've said, there's this incredible tension between consumers and people who have a vested interest in data ownership and in decentralization. And actually, these walled garden platforms who have made their money off the centralized digital economy. So what I'd love to hear from you is what you think needs to be true for people and for these platforms to say, yes, we're going to accept an open standard and we're going to bring these walls down and we're going to actually commit to interoperability. So when you look at history to that point about kings not giving up the kingdom, normally it ends up pretty bloody, right? Yeah. And the reason why it ends up bloody is because there is such an uprising and because the people have been put to such a brink and they know of a better alternative that they mm. see no choice. The nice thing about the metaverse, even if it's a sort of kingdom metaverse at the moment, is that there's no army and no military. So we think of this as a kind of bloodless revolution that can take place because at the end of the day, they can't actually bring in the military and stop that movement. But how do we ensure that we actually are able to do this? And from my perspective, it's as long as we build as open as possible, and all of us here contribute our talent, our know-how, our data into an open structure like true NFTs, 
then actually what happens is that the weight of that data becomes so powerful that at the end of the day, the platforms have to engage in it or else it become North Korea. One of the interesting examples is open source. Perhaps, perhaps the only thing or one of the few things that has survived the walled garden of Web 1, Web 2. Why is that? Because actually the code that people have developed in open source is developed by tens of millions of people. And the, and, and the ethos is that whenever I put some code in there, whatever modification I must, I must give back. And what's interesting now is even the biggest companies in the world can no longer sort of defeat open source, which means that code is actually broadly available to everyone. It's also the reason why a five person startup can compete with Google or with Alibaba and why we have that kind of startup culture because of open source, because in fact, that code is open. But that was one of the few things that survived that because the network effect of that code came from the millions of coders who contributed and saw the benefit, but there was no transfer of value possible. Meaning that the derivative, I mean, think about all the companies, for instance, in China, like a Xiaomi or Huawei or Lenovo, they all grew with open source. They used Linux and Android to build their businesses, right? But the code came from people all over the world. In the sort of blockchain parallel, what it means is, is that actually every person who contributed to that piece of code should receive a small sliver of a royalty for their contribution. But instead, we see a derivative. The derivative is, oh, you're a great engineer for having built this open source code. Let me hire you for a big salary, right? But that is still nothing compared to the value that they generated, you know, for helping make a Xiaomi or a Lenovo or, you know, a new startup or Palantir because they all benefited from that, right? So that's kind of what this means, right? Because in this case, you have a way in which you can value that data. So build open and essentially, you know, if you have enough weight, which is what open source demonstrated that it can do, Right, with digital assets and the big platforms have no choice but to cave in. Amazing. And do you think that we're going to have some form of a revolution where, you know, I've heard you previously discussing this idea that people have invested their time, their money, you know, their resources in in-game goods in these platforms that aren't open. And that gives the platforms an immense amount of bargaining power because people have vested their lives in there. But then again, when the platform goes bankrupt, these assets now become non-transferable. Do you think people are going to say, okay, I know I've invested a lot in these platforms, but I see the high risk of continuing investing. So I'm going to start moving to open platforms and have that kind of revolution come about, which is going to force this change. Absolutely. I think that, you know, people aren't stupid. I think the big thing about this is just about education. And I sometimes liken this, the scenario you are because, you know, we call it sort of digital feudalism for a reason, because it is a feudal age. And like the feudal age, we're going around telling to, you know, the sort of serfs and peasants of the world, you should own your property. That's a good thing, right? Don't work for the landlord, work for yourself. And that parallel for most people were like, why should I do that? That seems strange. Let me just to go about my day. And that's kind of what we see today when people are confused about NFTs and digital property rights, because they don't understand it yet. However, that is changing when, you know, my friends or my neighbors or my other people next to me are suddenly making all this money or actually getting the benefits of capital, right? It's no different from, you know, us, you know, if we had, were able to or should have bought real estate in most places that we live in today, we would have benefited from the growth of that capital, right? The world, you know, we think of this as a much broader revolution here because we think it's the answer to universal basic income. We don't think this is a case where UBI is given as a sort of, um, sort of very socialist style gift. We think of it as universal basic equity, because that equity comes from our own time, from our own creativity. And that equity we create, we ought to actually have a stake in and then get carried value going forward. Once you understand that and the power of that, you don't go back. You know, everyone who's building in NFTs, you, I don't hear anyone saying, oh, I started doing with NFTs, that was awesome, but you know, let's go back to the old world. That hasn't happened. I've not any, seen anyone do that. And I, you know, some people liken it to the experience of taking the red pill. Maybe it is but it's such a better pill that I can't see any reason why you want to go back. And I think the same will be true for anyone who's gone down that road. Amazing. Um, and the final question from me before we move into the chat is obviously, you know, you are one of the first publishers and investors in play to earn games and seeing what's been going on with Axie and how revolutionary it is. And also actually the business models outside of it. So the scholarship programs, you know, the larger guilds, absolutely fascinating. And I'd love to know what other potentials you started seeing in the play to earn economy, not only to lift people out of poverty by them actually playing, but maybe also to have more permanent forms of work and increase their skill sets and just having the metaverse economy as 
the future of the gig economy in a lot of ways? I think the metaverse economy is the future of work. The reason why I say that is because the metaverse right now, we have crude forms of that. Axie Infinity is, you know, I describe Axie Infinity as the NFT Angry Birds gaming moment, right? <laughs> which, was, which was incredible at the time when you think about what it did for mobile gaming. But it was a fairly early kind of game, right? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the kind of game what we are playing today, but it sort of led the way and showed us the potential of that. That's kind of where we are today. It's that, it's that early, right? But the reason why, you know, and I think the parallel on this will be that there will be more sophisticated uh, versions of this and that sophistication will come into more value. For instance, what's happening in the sandbox is people are actually creating their own towns, building their own experiences, kind of like Roblox, but on blockchain. And what they're doing here is they're creating value by creating creative experiences and new experiences in a user-generated fashion. That's another example of you can own that sort of theme park you built or that sort of game that you build within an ecosystem and the assets in there can be sold and traded and you can get a permanent benefit for that. And the reason why metaverse work is so important is, you know, in the future, if you just have to take a look at where machine learning and AI is going and robotics, as, as, as I had sort of uh, explained earlier, you know, what comes and what you dig in terms of natural resources is no longer going to be the stuff from the ground that's important because machines can do so faster and more efficient and better than us. When you think about agriculture as an industry that is kept alive in many countries, it is a deficit approach to keep people in a job because they don't have another job when in fact the machine can absolutely do it better, but for political reasons is kept alive, right? That's just the way it is. So what is that work that a machine cannot do? And that is the metaverse in terms of creativity and output. Everyone here in the fashion industry is a creative person or involved in a creative object in one, thing or another, one form or the other. What is creativity? It is divergent thinking approaches. It is about empathy. It is about design. It's about all these things that a machine has difficulty doing. And if we think about the long-term future of humanity as a whole, how do we compete against the world's fastest calculator that can do machine calculations better than anyone here put together? It's not going to be because we can outcalculate any machine or be stronger than a machine or a robot. It's because we have feelings and because we have emotions and we have sort of divergent thinking and creativity. And that is something that makes us human. And it is the defense of sort of the existence of where we are and what we end up doing in metaverse work will be entirely creative as a result. And, you know, when you think of the world, even today, you know, my parents' generation sometimes had to worry about food on the table. So scarce resources was important. The industry was developed this way. This generation probably doesn't have to think too much about sort of, do I worry about generally food on the table? The next generation actually doesn't have to worry about any of that and can perhaps commit their entire time in terms of new ideas and new sciences and new discoveries in creative ways because everything else is provided for. So that is basically kind of, you know, it sounds very sort of, you know, Gene Roddenberry, Star trek -y. But when you think of it in that context of, you know, what universal basic equity could become in the form of data ownership, which comes from ourselves, it is entirely possible, we think, and we think is a better way to look at the future than the ones about the useless human because of AI. Brilliant. That's, that's such a phenomenal way of looking at it. Um, and also addressing that fear of automation with, actually, it's just giving you possibilities to work in more interesting ways and more fruitful ways for yourselves and your creativity. So a question that we've gotten from the audience now is to do with actually the way that you mitigate the environmental issues that still are existent with the blockchain space, um, the larger technology space. And obviously, as we move towards these social improvements, there's still right. vast computing power used. So how do you see that evolving? So I think there's a few things. Um, I think the fact that there's an environmental cost is real, of course, particularly for proof of work. I think just to make a quick distinction, you know, the way where the blockchain ecosystem is going is broadly in proof of stake. Uh, proof of stake essentially is another form of consensus that is by order of magnitude, in some cases, 50 to 100 times or even more, sort of less, sort of, uh, less, uh, sort of carbon costly as say proof of work, like what you see with Ethereum on Bitcoin. So in general, uh, you know, it's already going down. And that the way that I sometimes describe it is, you know, if you map out the future of the automobile industry on the basis of the sort of carbon footprint of the cars to 100 years ago, we'd be all in trouble. But of course, because of technology and improvements, even Ethereum is going to sort of proof of stake, you see those efficiencies happening. But the other thing I want to point out, and I think this is maybe a slightly controversial way to look at it, but we think is really important, is that there is always a cost and we can offset it with, like with Sandbox, we have a so with Offsetra, we do carbon 
we calculate the carbon output and then we basically sort of buy carbon credits to offset because that is a that is a responsibility one has to have but the reality is that when it comes to maintaining a network of consensus there has to be a cost to that consensus right consensus is you know in the sort of physical world is democracy right the democracy and, and the cost of democracy there's also something there you need an administration you need people to run it you need a system you know the cost of maintaining the democracy of a country has a footprint as well has a cost uh, and if you if you want that to be secured if you want your property rights secured right if you want to make sure there's a judiciary that protects your property if it is stolen from you or a government that listens to you that consensus is what you're paying for when you're paying with a blockchain consensus right and i think people don't understand that because they think of it as a data structure but someone has to pay for that consensus. Maybe ones are more expensive and cheaper. We can optimize it, but it can't be free. Otherwise, it becomes centralized. And when it's centralized, we're all in trouble. Amazing. Um, and another question that we've had, which I have, um, I have a couple of opinions on myself, but it's this idea of, do you think the metaverse has to parallel our real lives? So if we want to buy clothes in the metaverse, do we automatically need them in real life and vice versa? And I think you can probably extrapolate this out to within reason, a range of digital goods. I know I, I personally would love an Axie in real life that was kind of <laughs> blobbing fluffily on my, on my kitchen table. But what do you see the parallel between um, digital culture, real life culture, and actually also what I would see as the synthesis of our digital and physical identities being? So first of all, we're of the view that our identities is already very virtual to begin with. And I don't mean that because of our presence in Instagram or Facebook. I mean that we create personas and we identify with really personal, invisible things rather than physical things. Of course, sometimes we personify that in some, something that we wear or something that we do. But when we talk about things like character, when we talk about things like purpose or values, actually, what is that? It's entirely virtual in context. And those who identify ourselves in that kind of context, that's already virtual in its sense. So when you think about also, you know, how many people, you know, have sort of, sort of admired sort of celebrities, for instance, you know, or maybe even fallen in love with them or had sort of crushes on them, but you never met them really. You've only seen them on TV, you've seen them from far, and you've started to fantasize in your mind about sort of cool experiences with them, right? You have a crush on them. That's entirely virtual as well, right? And it's, it's not real really in the physical sense, but they're very real to you or to, you know, the 100 million BTS fans that are out there, for instance, right? So, so I would say that we've already, uh, we're already in that virtual sort of state as it is. But what we uh, sometimes look to do is to enhance it in the form of AR or VR to create these experiences to make them more real. But the one thing that we as people have is imagination. That imagination is an incredibly powerful thing, right? We're able to sort of insert things in there that never existed before which is you know, both dangerous, but also amazing and powerful because that's basically where all these ideas, spaces have come from. So you know, maybe it's a bit of a cop out of an answer, but <laughs> my point on this is, is that you know, we're already existing very virtual to begin with. We always have been. It's just that we have treated because of the fact that there's a screen you know, uh, in, that is sort of maybe a virtual representation. But when you think about how it makes us feel, how we, how we react to it, it's actually probably already as real as, as anything else. 100%. And I also think, you know, what we've had, for example, with the transition to social media, you have people trying to portray altered versions of their physical lives. And I think there's now this increased acceptance when you move into game or you move into a direct to avatar economy, that it's okay to actually have a completely distorted version to an extent where your virtual life is your, your primary life, and you actually don't have to be tethered to biologically determined characteristics or characteristics to do with your intelligence, your fortune with wealth, and you can actually reconstruct identity. And it's not cheating. It's no, that's really right. in, in yeah. worlds. Yeah, and in fact, it's not cheating at all, because if you think about sort of your virtual identity today, and as I sort of maybe mentioned earlier, if you actually lose your virtual identity, actually what happens to your self-worth, right? Or your ability as a person, it, it diminishes. So we, you know, I didn't mention this, but we think of data really as a human right. Data rights ought to be a human right because it is in fact a critical thing like property ownership is a human right. But of course, because we haven't quite understood this at a governmental level, right? it's not been established this way and the rules around this are new, but in the future, we think this will definitely be sort of come to pass in that way. Mm, really, really interesting. And I think the final question, um, 
I loved the way that you said NFTs are these cultural moments. And something that I've been seeing in the digital fashion space in contrast to the digital art space where, you know, we've seen the digital world start to become a zeitgeist and infiltrate the physical world, you know, board apes at Christie's and crypto punks is what constitutes a cultural moment? And how does that then have this virtual significance? How does it, you know, get placed into a digital asset in a way that holds significance, holds context for a prolonged piece, piece, uh, period of time and really retains value? Well, I think the very first thing to think about cultural moments is that culture isn't just a zeitgeist of an entire country. Culture is a traditions too. And what is a tradition? A tradition can be a family tradition, whether you have, you know, turkey on Thanksgiving on odd days, or whether you, everyone gives out sort of, you know, like, you know, I don't know, like, like $5 gifts instead of something valuable, whatever. Like we all create our own kind of small cultural moments within our own families and the way that we grow up as well. These are traditions. And then we have broader cultural traditions like Christmas or like, you know, Hanukkah or whatever, you know, or religion, right? These are broad cultures that we adopt. And of course, then you have memes as well that completely take over the world as well. In other words, these are also forms of culture. So there are some forms of culture that I'm sure many people in this industry have been involved in, in creating mass culture as well. And those are powerful and those are pop and everything. But I think the biggest engagement that we're seeing really are in these micro cultures and these micro traditions that we have just within our friends, our communities, our fist bumps, whatever it is that we do. And this now can be embodied with these NFTs, right? As a, as a memory, we hold on to these in physical ways in terms of, hey, I remember that. I look at a photo of a childhood memory and that is special, but maybe only for those two people and nobody else. That's now permanent with NFTs. And that's something that you can take with you. And that's the power really here, right? NFTs don't have to be something, you know, that speaks to a million people. If it speaks to just 10 or 20, that's good enough. And if you can create moments like that, you know, like, like, a, like, a, like a sort of permanent diary, if you will, over time that accrues value. And maybe if you're a famous person or you become very famous, that diary becomes very valuable anyway. But that's not why that person made that diary. It just happened to be that way. First of all, I, I, I so don't want to stop the two of you because it's been phenomenally um, mind blowing. And I think the chat, all of the points in the chat actually would say to that, that this is the reason why we really wanted you yet to speak was because you bring it to a different plane. You make us think much more deeply about our engagement with the, our, our data, with our rights, with actually that it should be a human right. I mean, like I had never thought of it in that sense. And also you tied it down to our identity, which actually, you know, fashion is a very big thing about talking about identity. And so I, I just wanted to thank you very, very much for taking your time out of your ridiculously busy schedule to do this for the fashion industry. And also thank you very much, Daniela, for you know, asking all of these questions because you really brought everything to, to, to light. And with that, we are moving straight on to the next panel because we're taking time from their panel. <laughs>